Well, Mark and I are back at Richmond Beach State Park on the shores of Puget Sound again. Now, we want to continue the discussion by talking about inference to the best explanation, sometimes called an explanatory argument. So in this type of argument, one uh, states facts that are in need of explanation, and then you decide what to infer from those facts by thinking about what would, about what would best explain those facts. So the structure of this kind of argument, inference to the best explanation, is going to begin with facts in need of explanation. It's then going to look at possible explanations of the facts. And since time is limited, we usually only look at the plausible explanations. That would be explanations that are possible relative to our background knowledge, general knowledge of the world, independent of the facts under consideration. And we decide what to infer, what to conclude by thinking about what would best explain the facts. And there are criteria for what makes one explanation better than another, independent criteria, which we'll discuss. So we start with a common sense example of this type of reasoning, which is employed all the time. We use this type of, type of reasoning in everyday life all the time. So let's suppose that, that um, we are in a a uh, fraternity house with a lot of different people living there. And we come home and the meatloaf, the leftover meatloaf, is gone. Tragedy strikes. And the question, of course, is what happened? Where did it go? Who ate it? Who disposed of it? Whatever. Now, there are, ex there are lots of possible, there are an infinite number of possible explanations, aren't there? Um, we, could, we could say that Martians from outer space landed in the backyard, came into the house, and took it for a scientific test of our food. I would, That's a I would rule that out pretty quick. By? Well, it's just not consistent with what I take to be true about the world. It's not consistent with what we know about the world. Right. So it doesn't fit in with background knowledge. Right where background knowledge just would be what we know about the world independent of the facts in this case. Yeah. I, I fully recognize that my beliefs about the background, about the, not, about the world might be mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be in my belief that the world is flat, in mm -hmm. which case I'm going to rule out all kinds of round earth hypotheses, but uh, I'm pretty confident there aren't Martians running around taking meatloaf. I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. Could be. But sure, I don't think we're so. fallibilists. Yeah. But about observational data. Well, that's going to keep me from embracing that hypothesis from the get-go, because yeah. I just don't believe in Martians. Okay, so let's rule that hypothesis out as not really plausible. It's not consistent with background information. So here's another hypothesis. Uh, Joe ate the meatloaf. He's a member of the fraternity house. And uh, here's another hypothesis. Pete ate the meatloaf. Mm, these are possibilities. Now, now, let's suppose that Joe is a vegetarian. So, and Pete, Pete's favorite food is meatloaf. And then another hypothesis is going to be the cat ate the meatloaf. More likely than Martians, but okay, okay. But right. the I'm problem is we locked the meatloaf up in the fridge yeah. when we left. So now, which hypothesis best explains the facts in need of explanation. Well, there's, there's problems with at least a couple of them. You got the, the vegetarian Joe, you got the carnivore, or at least the omnivore Pete, and the cat. Uh, it goes against my knowledge about cats' ability to open up refrigerators to really take the cat hypothesis too seriously. Okay, it's so logically it's not plausible. possible. It's not plausible. The humans get into refrigerators much more readily than people. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's an internal inconsistency with vegetarians eating meatloaf, particularly Joe, who apparently is quite a strong Let's vegetarian. say he's very religious about it. Oh, yeah, I've seen him carrying the signs around. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that would be, it's possible he might have done. He might have taken the meatloaf and just thrown it away as an act of civil disobedience to the household, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and you haven't told me he's not that kind of guy, but given the information you've given me, uh, it's more likely the, the meat eater is going to take the meatloaf than, Pete. Pete, than, the, than the vegetarian, all else being mm -hmm. equal. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the best explanation so far is Pete. Ate it. ate it. Yeah. So given the facts, the, the best explanation is probably going to be Pete ate the meatloaf. And that's best in several, uh, based on several independent criteria. It explains the facts. Mm -hmm. It fits in with our background knowledge. Mm -hmm. 
doesn't contradict our background knowledge. It's internally consistent. There's no conflict in, within the hypothesis itself. Uh -huh. yeah. And it does explain the facts. Yeah. And uh, Relatively simple. I'm not having to appeal to strange entities like Martians. Right. We could see, here's, here's another hypothesis that we could bring into the picture. Let's evaluate it briefly. Let's suppose I hypothesize that Pete had 10 friends over and they all split the meat loaf up, loaf up 10 ways. Mm -hmm. That also would account for the fact that the meat loaf is gone. But if I have no evidence that Pete had 10 friends over at all, that's a more complex hypothesis mm -hmm. than just supposing Pete alone came home and ate the meatloaf and went to bed. Mm -hmm. Because 10 entities is more complex than one. So we, we say that one hypothesis is simpler than another if it involves or postulates more explanatory entities or more principles mm -hmm. or more things in the world than the other. So the, the hypothesis that Pete and a gang of 10 friends came over and ate it involves 11 people. Mm -hmm. The hypothesis that Pete ate it involves one person. It's simpler. And many philosophers think that if we have a tie, if two uh, hypotheses tie in terms of explaining the facts, the simpler is preferable, all things equal. Mm -hmm. They both equally explain the facts, but one simpler, we prefer the simpler. If you've got a hypothesis or a theory that has two parts and another one has five parts, and the evidence is dead equal for both theories. It can't both be true. If you've got one theory with two parts, one with five, this can go wrong a couple ways. This can go wrong five ways. All else being equal, I'm going to probably take a good close look at this one, embrace this one tentatively, um, just because there's fewer ways to go wrong. It may still be that this is the right theory, but we're stipulating that there's no evidence uh, supporting one over the other. Mm -hmm. All else being equal, this is looking like a, a more embraceable theory. The simpler one. Yeah, the simpler one. Well, yeah, and many philosophers have argued for the, what's called the principle of simplicity, also called Occam's razor, uh, on the grounds that if we follow that principle and always choose the simpler explanation when two explanations tie, that we will minimize the risk of error minimize. in the long run. In the long run, we'll make fewer mistakes, we'll believe fewer false propositions in the long run. So of course, min minimize the risk of error. If there's more evidence for the complicated theory, and there's little evidence for the simple theory, I want to go with the complicated theory. Mm -hmm. Not because it's complicated, because there's actually evidence or reasons to support it. Right. We're saying dead even. Only if two theories equally explain the data, right. but one's simpler than the other, do we prefer the simpler. So that's um, the type of reasoning known as inference to the best explanation. We infer that something is the case on the grounds that it's the best explanation of certain facts in need of explaining. And we evaluate explanations and choose one as the best on the basis of criteria that we weigh the hypotheses against, independent criteria. So we, uh, one hypothesis is better than another if it explains the facts better, if it explains more of the facts, if it's con if more consistent with background information, if it's more plausible, if it's internally consistent and the other one isn't. We also tend to favor explanations if they um, make predictions that we can test, if they're more fruitful. Mm -hmm. That is to say they lead, they open up ideas for future research. It's probably why some like theological explanations, though they may or may not be true, that's not my point here, but if I was to say uh, such and such happened and it's because God willed it, uh, philosophically or scientifically, it may very well be true that God willed this action to take place. Maybe God exists and wanted this to take place, but it's tough to test it. And it's tough to be able to come up with some way of determining whether that actually was caused by God or not. And it just can be frustrating because you can't do much with it. It might be true, mm -hmm. uh, but I think that might be explains why so many scientists tend to look for non-theological um, explanations, because mm -hmm. uh, that's what science does, is look for things that can actually be tested and it may, they may be misguided, it could be maybe they'll be looking and going for a blind alley because maybe if God exists he actually could have done this thing, but we're not, uh, it's kind of outside the area of testability sometimes. And testability is valued when you're comparing various hypotheses to explain various data, that's true. But I think that gets the student into the material at least, and uh, so thank you for your time.